Your voice, your opinion, your community. Fact TV, free speech, protected. I can only imagine what it will be like when I walk by your side. I can only imagine what my eyes will see when your face is before me. I can only imagine. Yeah. Surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus, or in awe of you be still? Will I stand in your presence, or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? As, uh, as children growing up, you quick, quickly learn what it requires of us to please our parents. And we get used to that, pleasing them, or we end up being sent to bed without dinner. <laughs> and we also learn how to take and please our teachers, or we end up spending a lot of time sitting in a quiet seat in the corner somewhere in the classroom. As teenagers, we learn how to please our friends, or else we end up with no friends. And as adults, we learn what it takes to please our spouse, or else we live a very lonely life. So pleasing others is something that um, we don't have to have uh, conferences about. It's just something that comes naturally as we uh, live our lives. We learn how to please others. And that, that is a good thing, but it can be taken too far, right? Sometimes, remember that we can go too far, that if we put our parent or our teacher or our friend or our spouse ahead of God, we will easily get ourselves into trouble. As a Christian, have you ever really thought about what is required for you to please God? I'm sure you have. <coughs> I think as we read through the scriptures this morning, you can get a pretty good idea of what it requires uh, of us in order to please God. In Ephesians chapter 4, it tells us to be kind. In Psalm 86, it tells us to be ready to forgive. And in Luke chapter 6, it tells us to love our enemies. But is there a place in the Bible that we can turn to and get a concise overall answer for what it takes for us to please God. And I'm uh, going to suggest this morning that there is such a place, and it's found in the book of Micah. So if you want to turn your Bible to Micah and follow along with me, you go to uh, Obadiah, and then Jonah, and then there's Micah, then there's Nahum and Habakkuk. Found uh, buried there in the middle of the minor prophets, those short books that we have. On Wednesday nights in the uh, in Troop of Baptist Church, uh, we've been going through um, the minor prophets. And uh, this week we start Malachi, which is uh, the last one. And so we've had a good time going through there. And finding out that although these are small books, uh, they have tremendous messages in them. And they're all very specific to needs that the, that the people um, 
before captivity had, uh, had need of. And uh, Micah is one of those uh, books that we find. So, in verses 1 and 2, we see uh, Micah's introduction. The theme of the book of Micah is judgment. And our holy and just God is bringing judgment on his people because of their sin, as Micah prophesies. Micah lives some 20 miles southwest of Jerusalem, but his prophecies were both for the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. It was just after the Assyrians turned their back on the Lord, and so the Lord questions them as to why would they do such a thing? What had the Lord done in order to uh, prompt their disobedience? The issue here is not with God, however. Uh, the issue is with his people. God reminds them in verse 4 of the things that he had done for them. Not only he, had he not done anything to cause them to turn against him, but then he starts in the next couple of verses to list things that he has done to profit them. And so in verse 4 it says, For I brought thee up out of the land of Egypt, and I redeemed thee out of the house of servants. Maybe they have forgotten how God had uh, brought them out of the land. Uh, they seem quick to be willing to give credit to a golden calf for bringing them up out of the land. But God says he redeemed them out of Egypt. He gave them leaders in Moses and Aaron and Miriam to direct them and to speak to them for God. In verse 5, God reminds them that what had happened as they were crossing the wilderness towards the promised land, he says, remember now what Balak, the king of Moab, consulted and what Balaam answered. Balak was the king that had heard about this small nation as they left Egypt and they were traveling to Moab to pass through the nation of Moab. And they, they were afraid of uh, Israel because God was working for them. And they had heard of how God had protected them and guided them thus far in their, in their travels. So uh, this king, though, he asked the prophet Balaam to curse the nation as they arrived there at Moab. And you can read further about it in Numbers, chapters 22, 23, and 24. But in chapter 23, uh, Balaam makes this statement. He says, how can I curse whom God hath not cursed? We know that Balaam came up with an idea which was pretty destructive uh, for the nation of Israel. But he was not... Uh, willing to curse them as the king had asked. So God had kept his people safe again. God had not done anything wrong, but he was on their side directing them with a fire and a cloud. He was providing them with their needs for food and water as they traveled. So God indicts them because of their uh, turning away from him. <coughs> In the next couple of verses, uh, we have the people's answer. The <coughs> third section here is the people's answer. Verse 6 says, Wherewith shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings and with calves of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams? With ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn of my transgression? The fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? 
<laughs> this time they were surrounded by pagans, people who were worshiping uh, Molech and also Baal. And so in uh, worshiping them, the heathen that they uh, had around about them, uh, they were offering human sacrifices. In fact, even King Ahaz and King Manasseh, uh, they even got involved uh, in this and had sacrificed their own children in an attempt to please God. With each of these Israelite questions, uh, they got more and more absurd. But they never promoted anything like uh, or close to child or human sacrifice. They were asking, what can we do externally to please God? What is it? We can bring sacrifices. We can bring these huge sacrifices. We could even be willing to uh, give our own children as a sacrifice to you. Well, they were asking, like I said, for external ways that they could please God. Dr. J. Vernon McGee, he wrote, external religion without internal experience, without reality on the inside, is absolutely valueless. God's not concerned about the exterior. God's not concerned about how we can do things to please Him. But that's, that's not what He's interested in. And the people of Israel, they, they couldn't see past that. They just thought by doing things to please God, like they had probably learned to do things to please their parents, please teachers, that that was sufficient, that that's what God would be pleased with. Problem was, their heart was very far from God. And with the heart is the only way that we can please God. So Micah gives this answer, verse 8. Micah's answer is that he has shown thee, O man, this is just not an answer for the men of 700 B.C. This is an answer that is relevant for us today uh, as it was back in Micah's time. And it's a comment that goes beyond just talking about men and how men can please God. So he goes on, he says, uh, What is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee? And then he gives them a simple, straightforward answer. What does God require of thee? That's something that we should be concerned with. For all that the Lord has done for us, providing salvation, for a bunch of sinners? Shouldn't it be natural that we would have a desire in our heart to be able to return thanks for what God has done for us? So I think it's a very pertinent question. What can we do to please God? Well, Micah suggests three things here. Number one, is we should do justly. But we just said, wait a minute, that God isn't concerned about the externals. God isn't concerned about what we do. And in thinking of it too, anything that we do that would be successful is not generated by us. It's the Lord working through us. So if we're going to do things for the Lord, 
we're only able to do them because God gives us the ability to do those things. So why, why would that please God? No, when it talks about do justly here, it's not talking about doing external things. Instead, it's talking about doing justly is to consistently develop a habit of making right choices. To be righteous. To be, whole, to be living holy lives. Not through the things that we do, but why do we do those things? What is the motivation? We can bring all kinds of gifts to the Lord, and when our heart's not right, it won't be pleasing to Him. Remember in the New Testament where they brought gifts to the altar, and we're told there that if your heart's not right with somebody, you need to leave that gift there and go and make things right. And then you can come back and you can offer that gift. So God isn't concerned about the external doing of things. He's concerned about what is your heart motivation? What is the motivation of your heart in doing the things that you do? That's what we can please God. In making right choices. Making right choices. You can only do justly if you have accepted the Lord as your Savior. There's no motivation in our hearts that would be pleasing to God if we don't know the Lord. Our motivations would be other than something that would please God. He's talking about what the inner attitude, our heart's condition as we do the things that we do. It's not what we do, it is why we do them. Why do we bring offerings to the Lord? Oh, but wasn't Abraham, wasn't he counted righteous because of all that Abraham had done? It doesn't, uh, that's not what we're told in the book of Romans. In Romans chapter 4, it says that Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him as righteousness. It's what happened in Abraham's heart and how it was changed towards God. That's the choice that he made. And that's how we can please God. By the choices that we make. And why we make those choices. Down the next two verses in Romans it says, But believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted him for righteousness. It's our faith. It's a heart attitude that is counted for righteousness, counted as pleasing uh, to God. Romans chapter 8 says, For they that are after the flesh do mind the penalty. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. If we have not had a born-again experience, if we have not had the Holy Spirit come in and be part of our lives and part of who we are, there's no way you can please God. So the first thing we need to examine in, in our desire to please God is do we know Him as our Savior? And anything you do prior to that not going to be pleasing to the, to the Lord. We cannot please the Lord. It says, but ye are not in the flesh, but you are in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God indwelleth you. Now if any have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. 
In Ephesians chapter 1, it says, According to as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. <clears throat> as we choose to receive the Lord Jesus as our Savior, <coughs> and he makes us that new creation, now we can please God. But again, not by the things that we do. You say, oh, my friend, you, you became a missionary and you went all the way to Guam, 7,000 miles away, to be able to tell boys and girls about the Lord. I really didn't do that. I, I couldn't do that. There was no way I wanted to uh, live overseas. <laughs> But it was God who did it through me. And anything that I accomplished for good was not of my doing. And then the second thing that uh, Micah mentions is that we should love mercy. Love mercy. Because you and I have been shown such great mercy from God, we ought to have the desire to have others experience that same great mercy that, that we have been shown. Hebrews chapter 4 says, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we might and we want others to experience that same thing that happened to change our part in our way. <laughs> them which should uh, thereafter believe in him for life everlasting. You and I as Christians are to be an example. To be an example from, for others. Wouldn't it, often, wouldn't it be really nice if when you came to know the Lord Jesus as your Savior, that he would automatically bring you to glory and death. I think fondly upon that sometimes. <laughs> the more trouble I get into, the more I think of it. But, but no, God's plan is for us to stay here and to do two things. Number one, as Second Peter showed us, to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord. And then number two is to be able to reflect that change in our hearts to the people around us. So that others would have a desire to come to know Christ as Savior. We are to love mercy. We are to love mercy so much that we become a a mirror, a reflection of God's love and God's mercy to others. And then lastly, Micah mentions to walk humbly. To walk. It's the way we live. It's the way we act. It's the things that we do. We're supposed to walk humbly. To become meek, which is not weak, Right? The best definition of meekness that I've heard is that it's strength under control. Strength under control is meekness. And we are have this strength that's under control and yet we're submissive. Uh, to the divine will of God in our lives. James says in chapter 4, God resists the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. It's humility that he can, uh, that would bless him. It's a way to please him. And 1 Corinthians chapter 1 says, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. 
For ye see your calling, brethren, of that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty and the base things of the world and things which are despised have God chosen. Yea, and things which are not to bring to naught the things that are that no flesh should glory in his presence. I live my life differently? How do I please God? I realize that I need to be willing to live a distinctively different life in this world. Are my actions a reflection of a heart making habitually right choices? Secondly, I need to be willing to love distinctively different from the world. Are my action a reflection of a loving, merciful heart as a pattern for others? And then third, thirdly, I will need to be willing to see myself distinctively different or honestly from the world. Are my actions a reflection of someone who doesn't think more highly of himself than he ought? And to seek to put others first in my life? What does God require for us to please Him? To do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly. First, we cannot do this without the indwelling Holy Spirit. Deuteronomy chapter 10. And now, Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee? But to fear the Lord thy God, and to walk in all of his ways, and to love him, and to serve the, God, the Lord thy God with all your heart and with all your soul. Micah 6, 8 is a verse that emphasizes that God is more interested in in the inner, inner attitude and moral character of his people than he is of any external doings that we might do. So as we seek to please God, we have to look inward. And we have to look at our motivations. What is motivating us? to live the Christian life? Is it the Holy Spirit's promises? Or are we not walking with the Lord at all? Are we just externally doing things? Oh, Sunday morning, time to go to church. So we hop in our cars and come out and sit in the church service. And we go home and we really haven't Worship God. We really haven't allowed the Holy Spirit of God to teach us, to continue to change us. Well, I hope that's not true of you. I hope that as you come to church, that you're desiring to meet with God. I'm overwhelmed when I think that. I get the privilege of standing behind the pulpit like this and sharing God's word and realizing that each of you are here this morning because you have a need to meet with God. And how is it that something that the Lord would allow me to say is going to make a difference in your life? I know we all have needs. And I know that God wants to meet every one of those needs. And so I pray this morning that God will have used this word again. And as you fellowship together uh, after the service and so forth, I pray that God would use you, motivate you, 
to look to make a difference, to encourage another believer. That's what's pleasing to God. That's what comes from the hearts. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for our time together this morning. Lord, I feel so inadequate to be able to preach, to be able to teach from your word. But Lord, I know it doesn't depend on me. It doesn't depend on my great ability. Just you just ask me to be obedient. And so I, Lord, I pray for uh, each one this morning here that we would uh, recommit ourselves and realize that it's not an outward thing that's going to impress you. It's an inner thing. It's as we seek to choose to give our lives to you that will please you. For it's in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. I can only imagine what it will be like when I walk by your side. I can only imagine what my eyes will see when your face is before me. I can only imagine, yeah. Surrounded by 